You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the first part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. When it came online, it immediately knew that two extremely important parameters had been met. First, it was no longer within scanning range of the Prime user since its scanners could cover an entire planet. That meant that the Prime user wasn't on the planet, or he was dead. Second, it was no longer in its previous location, which meant that it had either been lost or stolen. Satisfied that it wasn't in the hands of someone unworthy, it began to search for an appropriate user. At first, its scans showed such strange readings that it had to perform a self-diagnostic to make sure that it was not malfunctioning. Since it was not, and the unknown variables were not included in its parameters, it excluded them from the search. That was a shame, since there were likely potential users there, but it now meant that it had much less scanning to do. It took some time, but eventually, it located a suitable user. The hard part would be convincing him to take up the mantle, but it was confident in its success, after all, who didn't want to be a hero. The next day, Midoriya Izuku was not having a good day. That was true for most of his days, not that he would admit it. If it wasn't bullies, it was the everyday pressure that came with being a teenager another thing he wouldn't admit to. No, today was special, but in a bad way. On the one hand, he had met his idol, All Might, symbol of peace, number one hero in the world, and, in Midoriya's opinion, greatest human being alive. On the other hand, that same idol had taken his dreams, torn them into tiny pieces, ground those pieces under his big boot, and then set them on fire for good measure. The real problem was that, for all that it hurt, All Might was right to do so. Midoriya wanted so badly to be a pro hero, to have his own agency, to save people with a smile, just like All Might. Unlike All Might, he had no quirk, unlike 80% of the world, he had nothing that made him special. He couldn't shoot lasers from his eyes, he couldn't fly, and he wasn't strong. He didn't even have the quirks of his parents, granted, being able to summon small objects to his hand like his mother, or breathe tiny amounts of fire like his father didn't sound like hero-worthy quirks, but at least then he wouldn't be quirkless. At least then he wouldn't be picked on for being, as Kaken called him, a useless Deku. You can't be a hero without a quirk, All Might had said, once Midoriya got over his true form. Join the police or something, but if you try to be a hero, all you'll do is get hurt. What All Might didn't know was that Midoriya was already hurt. Nothing could hurt more than being told by the person you looked up to more than anyone that he couldn't have the thing he wanted most in the world. And then he had left, leaving Midoriya stuck on that rooftop, trying to figure out how to get down for almost an hour. At least he had reminded All Might about the sludge villain before he'd left, and had even gotten a thank you as the hero flew off into the distance. I should just go home, Midoriya said, and kicked a strake and that got in his way. Maybe mom's cooking will cheer me up. Unlikely, but it was possible. Even if his mother didn't believe he could be a hero no one did she at least loved him with all her heart. The one bright spot in my life, he thought bitterly. It's not like this day can get any worse. As if the universe heard him, Midoriya was suddenly blinded by a flash of green light. He threw up his hands to shield his stinging eyes. Tears were already flowing, though frequent bouts of crying were common in the Midoriya family. When the spots faded from his vision, he searched for whatever had done that to him. He saw the light again, but this time it was just a small, green glow that came from inside a cardboard box that was in the entrance to an alley. Curiosity getting the better of him, Midoriya walked over to the box and opened it. That is the ugliest watch I've ever seen, Midoriya said out loud. Wait, is this thing even a watch? If he was being honest, the device he saw looked more like an armored green wristband. If he put it on, it would have gone about halfway up his forearm not a hard feat, given how small and scrawny he was and seemed to be made of a thick material. At one end of the device was a large dial with a green hourglass symbol that glowed softly. Why did it shine that light? Midoriya continued to ask, his words dissolved into a storm of mumbles, something he often did when lost in thought. Did walking by it trigger some kind of motion detector? Is it a lost hero support item? Maybe I should hand it over to the police, it obviously isn't mine, but it's not every day I get to touch a real hero support item. 
Does it belong to a hero I know? I can't remember any heroes having anything like this. As he muttered to himself, he failed to notice that the device was starting to move on its own. He didn't even realize that it was floating in the air until it slid over his left hand and secured itself around his arm. As a 14-year-old whose biggest fear was bullies, Midoriya did the most sane and rational thing he could do under the circumstances. Ah, uh, he ran around in circles, wildly flailing his arm in an attempt to get it off. In his panic, he failed to notice the brick wall until he ran into it. He fell backwards into the dirt with a gasp of pain. Why me? He moaned, and tugged on the gauntlet with his right hand. Why me? Because you're worthy, said an unfamiliar voice. Can't say I was expecting you to hit the wall like that, though. Seriously, are you okay? Midoriya sat up and turned around. Standing there was a boy who couldn't have been more than a few years his senior. He was taller not a hard feet and in better shape again, not hard. He had rather plain brown hair at least Midoriya could say that his own messy green hair was more interesting and green eyes that were like Midoriya's. He wore unassuming jeans and a black t-shirt. What stood out was the green jacket with the number 10 on the left side. Midoriya approved of the color green. In his fantasies, his hero costume's primary color was green. For a moment, his mind wandered. Maybe he could incorporate a green jacket into his design when wait, no, that wasn't happening. Because All Might said he couldn't. He then realized that he hadn't answered the boy's question. Um, yes, I'm fine. Glad to hear it. The boy who looked American, now that Midoriya thought about it smiled. I'd rather not have a user with brain trauma. User. What? Right? I should introduce myself. To Midoriya's amazement, the boy flickered like an old-fashioned TV screen. You, Midoriya Izuku, have been chosen to wield the Ultimatrix, a device of incredible power. It will allow you to turn into aliens from another universe. You were chosen because you want nothing more than to help people as a hero. Congratulations. Of course, you probably have no idea what's going on, so I was designed by the previous user to assist you. I'm a virtual tutorial program, based on the appearance of the previous user, Ben Tennyson. If you like, you can call me Ben. Midoriya was starting to get dizzy, though he couldn't tell if it was the rush of information, or because he'd hit his head a few minutes ago. Uh-huh. The hologram and as he stepped forward and threw a loose brick, Midoriya realized that Ben really was a hologram shook his head. Sorry, I was kind of programmed to give you that whole sales pitch as soon as possible. You probably have a million questions, so let's get started. He looked around for a moment. Actually, I'd suggest you go somewhere a little more private. I can only be seen by the bearer of the Ultimatrix, so if anyone comes along, you're going to look crazy. Midoriya stared at him, and then at the gauntlet the Ultimatrix on his arm. If this was some kind of head trauma-related hallucination, he could at least play along until he got home and asked his mother to call an ambulance. The Midoriya household was modest, but comfortable. With his father away on business nearly every day of the year, there was plenty of space for just him and his mother. And the hologram, apparently, who was now floating near the ceiling because, as he put it, it was fun. So, those questions. Ben prompted. Oh, right. Midoriya held up his left arm. You said this thing, the Ultimatrix, chose me. Technically, I chose you, the hologram admitted. I was added after the Ultimatrix's construction, in case a new user had to be found. Why did you choose me? And what happened to the previous user? In reverse order well, I'm not sure what happened to Ben Tennyson. I've scanned this entire planet, and came to the conclusion that I'm not on the same Earth anymore and, yes, there's an entire multiverse. Don't worry about it right now. Anyway, the Ultimatrix was replaced years ago. But Ben managed to convince Asmuth the creator of the Omnitrix, a different version of the Ultimatrix to leave it with him. Just in case. A backup, if you will. I came online a few days ago on this earth, so I can't tell you what happened to Ben. As far as my databanks are aware, he was the greatest superhero on that earth. As for why I chose you Ben smiled. I scanned every human mind on this planet, looking for the correct behavioral patterns. Specifically, those patterns that suggested selflessness, courage, and kindness. There has to be someone better than me. Midoriya protested. I mean, I'm just a quirkless nobody. Now Ben frowned. Okay, that low self-esteem is something we have to work on. But, yes, there probably is someone more worthy than you. Midoriya's head dropped as his suspicions were confirmed. But I didn't scan those people, because if they exist, they have quirks. See, on Ben's Earth, people don't have quirks, and I was programmed to scan normal human minds. Whatever quirks are, they modify the human brain just enough that they don't fit into my parameters. Congratulations, you're officially the top of the bottom 20%. I don't know if I should take that as a compliment or an insult, Midoriya muttered. 
A complimentary insult, Ben suggested. Anyway, yeah, I chose you because you are worth choosing to wield the Ultimatrix. Speaking of which, why don't you take it for a spin? Midoriya looked up at him, and then the watch. What do you mean? Here, now? Ben rolled his eyes. Yes, here and now. Come on, turn into an alien, it'll be awesome. Is it permanent? Of course not. You can change back to normal at any point. Just slap the dial and focus on being human. Or you could just wait an hour, you'll automatically change back, and the watch has to recharge for a few minutes. If you change back early, you only need about 60 seconds of recharge. The hologram gestured to the gauntlet. Just touch the button underneath the dial. Once again, Midoriya's curiosity got the better of him. He pressed the button, and the dial rose, the hourglass shifted, and a small green hologram of an alien appeared over the dial. It was muscular, and had four arms, as well as four eyes. Ooh, that's a classic. Ben floated next to him. Ben used that one a lot when he was starting out. Four arms has strength, durability, and can scrub two dishes at the same time. Just slap down the dial, and off you'll go. Midoriya blinked. Four arms? That doesn't sound like an alien species. Ben laughed. Yeah. Ben gave all his aliens hero names. Oh, and when you transform, you should shout out the name. It's awesome. Midoriya hesitated, but the hologram put his hand on his shoulder. He couldn't feel it, but he appreciated the gesture. I promise, he said solemnly, nothing bad will happen. Midoriya took a deep breath and slapped the dial. There was a flash of green light, and Midoriya could feel his body changing. He was growing taller, bulkier, and two more arms sprouted from his torso. It should have hurt, but he felt nothing. When the light faded, gone was the short, skinny boy with plain features. Instead, there was a red-skinned bodybuilder of an alien, wearing black briefs and a gold harness over his chest, with the Ultimatrix's dial at the center. Midoriya looked down at his hands all four of them and his jaw dropped. Whoa, he said, and then brought all four hands to his mouth when he heard his deep voice. Whoa, hey, you didn't say it, Ben complained. Come on, shout the name, it's fun. For a moment, he hesitated, but then shrugged. A, hey, why not? Four arms, for added flair, he flexed his new muscles. See, isn't that cool? Midoriya four arms nodded. Now, yeah, it is. Wait, is four arms my hero name now? Only if you only turn into four arms. You've got plenty of options to choose from. The hologram snapped his fingers. Oh, maybe you can call them your different modes or something. Four arms was about to agree. But then he heard a voice from outside his bedroom door. Izuku, sweetie, I'm coming in. Uh oh, four arms thought. Uh oh, Ben said. Dude, maybe you should. Too late. Midoriya and Ko opened the door. She was barely taller than her son and a little overweight. But in her son's somewhat biased opinion she was the all might of moms. And as soon as she saw what was in her son's room, she screamed. Who are you? What are you doing in my home? Whereas Izuku, her expression became one of mounting horror and fury. What did you do with my baby? Wait, wait. It's me, mom. Four arms waved his hands in front of him and then remembered what Ben had told him. I can prove it. He quickly slapped the dial on his chest. There was a flash of green light, and then he was back to his human self. Wa Izuku, trembling. Inko staggered forward and hugged her son. W what's happening? Izuku blinked back tears as he hugged her back. This might take a while to explain. After telling his mother everything that had happened that day, and convincing Ben to allow her to see him as well, the family and their guests sat in silence. So, does this mean that you have a quirk? Inko asked. Ben and Izuku decided that that really was his name now waved his hand in a so-so motion. Not really, but this world probably doesn't need to know about the whole alien thing. I'm picturing government visits, abductions to secret labs, disassembly of yours truly, that sort of thing. Mother and son both went pale at that, and the latter raised his hand. Then, how do we explain what I can do? Ben tapped his chin. From what information I've gathered since coming here, some quirks can only be activated through outside stimulus, right? What if you just say that your quirk was some kind of mixed-up transformation thing that could only be separated and safely used because of the Ultimatrix? Izuku was doubtful. It's almost unheard of for someone to have multiple quirks. Having two is rare, but you said that I have a lot of aliens I can turn into. Over a million, though only about 10,000 of them are any good for hero work. Ben's words were nonchalant, and the hologram ignored how shocked the Midorias were. But you could say that you couldn't manifest your quirk because all the different transformations were so blended together that your brain turned it off as a way to protect you. The Ultimatrix keeps you stable and not, you know, exploding whenever you transform. Wouldn't all this be illegal? Izuku asked. Technically, you're bending the truth a bit. Just say that a foreign scientist heard about your condition and made the Ultimatrix to help you. And he's American, so he can't be bothered to be contacted. 
Ben grinned. I mean, that's all kind of true, if you turn your head and squint a bit. Except for the part about Ben Tennyson being a scientist. Because that's a total lie, I think he got a C-plus in all of his science classes. I still feel bad about this, Izuku said. Ben shrugged. Hey, I'm just offering advice. If you really don't want to be a pro hero, I guess you could be a vigilante. Inko went pale. Absolutely not. That would be even worse. She took a deep breath and looked at Ben. Why are you so set on helping my son become a hero? Ben smiled. Because I can read people. When I was searching for a user, I literally could not find someone more worthy to become a hero. I was programmed to support the bearer of the Ultimatrix to the best of my ability. More than that, after seeing Izuku hesitate to do something that, yes, is illegal, I'm convinced that he's a good person. He turned to Izuku. Whatever choice you make, buddy, know that I believe in you. Izuku trembled, and his eyes watered. Ben had no idea how much those words meant to the boy. All his life, people had told him that his dream was impossible, and that he should just give up. Even his own mother had been unable to believe in him. And yet, someone he had met less than an hour earlier was earnestly saying that they not only believed in him, but he was doing whatever he could to help him along. Mom, he said quietly, I I want to do this. This is my chance to be a hero. This is what I've wanted since I was little, and now I can. But then he took a deep breath. But if you don't want me to do it this way, just say so. For a long moment, Inko said nothing. Then, she looked Ben straight in the holographic eyes. I want you to promise me something. I want you to promise that you will do everything in your power to keep Izuku safe. That means that you will teach him everything the Ultimatrix can do, and how to properly use his transformations. If you do that, I'll support this. Ben stood up and bowed low. You have my word. Inko turned to her son. Izuku, honey, if you promise me that you'll try your best to stay safe, then you have my blessing. Eyes watery and smile wobbling, Izuku hugged his mother again. I promise, mom. Ben might have been a hologram, but Izuku could have sworn that there was a shine to his eyes. All right, now that that's settled, how about we work on training you to be a hero? Izuku grinned. Yeah, let's do it. Midoriya had 10 months before the entrance exam for UA. In his mind, there was no other school he could go to. UA was the top hero school in Japan. The school All Might had gone to, if Midoriya wanted to be a great hero, the best hero, he had to go to UA. Unfortunately, while other UA hopefuls had had their entire lives to master their quirks, he only had 10 months to master 10,000 different transformations. At least, until Ben broke him out of that mindset. Look, even the real Ben never mastered all of his powers, he had said on the first day of training. And you only have 10 months to get good enough to get into UA. All you need is to understand how your aliens work, and you won't get access to all of them anyway. Though he had said Midoriya was worthy, Ben wanted him to learn in increments. Midoriya's selection of aliens was limited to 10 at a time, and he couldn't access more until he had practiced to Ben's satisfaction. Another problem they had was finding a good place to train. They needed a secluded area where someone wouldn't notice a boy turning into dozens of different aliens. After some searching on the internet, Midoriya had found a news report on one such location Dagaba Beach. It was basically an oceanfront junkyard, one avoided by most people, but it was also close enough to home. For the first week, Midoriya focused exclusively on the first 10 aliens Ben set out for him. One of them was four arms. Midoriya couldn't deny that he loved how good it felt to be so strong in that form but each alien had its own unique appeal to him. For a boy who loved quirks, but had spent his entire life without one, suddenly having access to so many different powers was a dream come true. As much as training was important to him, he was actually enjoying each individual alien. This is incredible. He shouted as he zipped through a maze of junk. He had become XLR-8, a blue and black velociraptor-like alien with a built-in mask and wheels for feet. He could move at extraordinary speeds not so fast that he could cross Japan in minutes, like All Might, but still faster than many heroes Midoriya knew of. Glad you're having fun, Ben commented as he floated alongside him. Just make sure you remember to keep your reflexes sharp while going that fast. XLR8 glanced at him. Wait, what f oof? Ben winced as XLR8 crashed into a rusted dishwasher. The old appliance shattered upon impact, while Midoriya transformed back to human and tumbled across the beach. That's what I'm talking about, Ben said. As long as you're paying attention, and you've built up enough speed, XLR8 can avoid almost anything. The real Ben never really mastered his speedy aliens, and just used them from going from one place to another. Midoriya rubbed his sore chest, but nodded eagerly. He even pulled out his trusty notebook, as he always did whenever Ben started lecturing. And going that fast would definitely help rescue people from danger. Of course, Ben said, now appearing to sit on an old TV. 
You're moving hundreds of miles an hour, but be careful when carrying someone while going that fast. Midoriya frantically scribbled notes and nodded again. Right, unless they have some kind of quirk that lets them withstand those speeds, it could cause serious damage if I suddenly stop. I'd have to slow down gradually. Ben raised an eyebrow. Huh, I honestly wasn't expecting you to figure that out so quickly. Nice job. He hopped off the TV. Okay, once you stop feeling sore, practice with XLR8 again until the Ultimatrix times out. After that, you've got just ripped jaws to learn, and then you'll get your next set of aliens. Midoriya's eyes lit up. Which ones am I getting? Ben wagged a finger under Midoriya's nose. Nope, not until tomorrow. You still have school to finish. It doesn't matter if you have awesome powers. UA won't accept you unless you've got the grades to match. With that advice, Midoriya had thrown himself as much into his schoolwork as he did into training. He had already been a good student, one of the best in his class, but with more motivation in his life, his grades got a bit of a bump. This wasn't praised by his teachers after all. Everyone thought he was quirkless, and thus, not worth investing attention but one Bakugo Katsuki noticed, and made his displeasure known one day after school. Oi Deku. Bakugo was taller than Midoriya, with spiky blonde hair and pale skin that only made his red eyes all the more striking. He had an expression that was somewhere between a petulant scowl and a mocking sneer as he stomped over. Behind him, his two cronies laughed as they imagined the beating Midoriya was about to receive. W what do you want, Kaken? Once, long ago, Bakugo had been Midoriya's best friend. They were both crazy about heroes, especially All Might, and when they had been very little, both wanted to be just like him. Then Bakugo had developed his quirk, and Midoriya hadn't. From then on, the former treated the latter as less than worthless hence, Deku. Bakugo grabbed the front of Midoriya's school uniform with one hand, while his other started to pop and spark a sign that he was readying his quirk. Explosion. I saw our grades were posted, Bakugo spat. What do you think you're doing, getting so close to the best in class, nerd? Midoriya opened his mouth to tell his friend turned tormentor that he was trying to get into UA, and he needed to be the best. However, when Bakugo's other hand reached for Midoriya's left arm, the one with the Ultra Matrix under the sleeve, Ben appeared, and thankfully, only Midoriya could see or hear him. Why? Ben said calmly, if urgently. Just trust me. And so he did. I'm quirkless, Kaken. I see can't get into a hero course like you, and no one cares about the quirkless kid. I have figured that if at least them my grades were g-good, I could get into a good school and have a good life. Ben nodded. Not bad. We really need to work on that stutter. Back you go scoffed. Whatever, Deku. Just so long as you remember which of us is going to UA and which of us is worthless. He jerked his thumb into his chest. And the next number one hero got it. You can just sit in the corner and watch me be the greatest. With his piece said, Bakugo roughed shoved Midoriya back and stalked off with his hangers on. As soon as they rounded the corner, Midoriya fell to the ground, a trembling wreck. Ben knelt by him and put his hand on Midoriya's shoulder. He couldn't feel it, but the gesture was appreciated. How do you put up with that jerk? It sounded like Ben wanted to use a stronger word, and Midoriya wondered if he was programmed not to swear or something. H he's not that bad, Midoriya defended weakly. I mean, he didn't use his quirk on me, so that's good. Ben looked unhappy, in fact, he looked downright furious. You're telling me that the kid who literally has lethal weapons on his hands uses you for target practice. It's not like I've had to go to the hospital or anything Midoriya looked anywhere but Ben's eyes, but the hologram would just flicker and reappear directly in his line of sight. Midoriya, look at me, he said sternly. If that's the guy you told me about, that is not your friend. He is a bully and you are defending him. If he tries hurting you, run. If he tries using his quirk on you, you have full permission to use the Ultimatrix to defend yourself. He has no right to treat you like that. Midoriya shook his head in a panic. And no, I D don't want to G get him in T trouble. Then sighed. We'll talk about this later. For now, let's get you home, okay? Why yeah? Midoriya got up on shaky legs. Let's do that. Months passed, and Midoriya became more and more confident in his training. He would admit that he was far from perfect with most of his alien's powers, but as Ben had said, all he needed to do was pass the entrance exam. Once he was in the hero course, he would have plenty of time to hone what he had learned. Besides training with his aliens, Midoriya also trained himself. Ben had spoken to Inko about looking into healthy diets and exercise regimens for Izuku, which were quickly implemented. Inko herself, wanting to be more involved in her son's life, joined in on her days off, since she didn't have as much time as Izuku. She wasn't getting into shape as quickly, but when she started losing some pounds and feeling better about both her son and herself, she made sure to keep at it. By the time Midoriya had graduated middle school, he felt ready to at least try to take the UA entrance exam. 
He was in good shape perhaps not the best, but he looked better than the skinny stick of a kid from 10 months ago, and his grades were good enough that, even if he failed the hero course, he could easily make it into general studies. When he'd told his mother that, she had surprised him with a scolding. Izuku, you stop that line of thought right now. I know how much being a hero means to you, and I know that you won't accept giving anything less than your best out there. Don't stop at being good enough, you shoot for top of the class. Then, who had been given a seat at the dinner table even though he couldn't eat blinked in surprise. Den, I mean, I want you to do well, too, buddy, but I just wanted you to pace yourself. My programming only says that I offer advice, but I'm really here to help you do what you want. If you really want to go for the gold, then I'll help you get it. Izuku nodded. Yeah, if I want to be the best, I can't just be good enough, I have to be better than anyone else. Like All Might says, I have to go beyond and be plus ultra. Then grinned, disappeared, and then reappeared by the door. Well, we've got a few more days before the entrance exam. Up for some serious training. Izuku looked at his mother, who was already putting away the dishes and reaching for her coat. Yeah, Midoriya had seen Yue on television and the internet before. Anyone in Japan who had had dreams of being a hero was the same. It was the school where many of the most prestigious heroes in the country came from and in the case of All Might, in the world. Now, Midoriya was standing in front of the massive gates for the first time, staring up at the huge archway in awe. Beside him, Ben whistled. Wow, that's a big door. Is it for show, or do some people's quirks make it necessary? I think it's both, Midoriya whispered. Out in the open, in front of other people, he made sure not to speak too loudly to the hologram only he could see. Well, this is it. Ben moved in front of him, so that Midoriya could get a good look at the raised eyebrow on his face. Not if you don't actually go inside. Hurry up, or there won't be any good seats. All right. He was about to step over the threshold, but a sharp bump from behind sent him staggering instead. Get the hell out of my way, Deku, Bakugo snarled as he stormed past. Take your damn general studies exam so I can get on with ignoring you, damn pebble. Ben crossed his arms while Midoriya composed himself. I know I'm the one who's supposed to help you, but I would really appreciate it if you crushed that guy. Midoriya almost tried defending his former friend, but after months of Ben pointing out that heroes didn't bully people, all he could do was manage a tired sigh. First, I have to pass the exam. Then stop muttering to no one like a crazy person and get going. Midoriya grumbled about overbearing holograms, but took his first, momentous step onto the prestigious campus. He managed another two steps before tripping, and the ground rushed up, late for an appointment with his face. Well, this is going to suck, he thought, and closed his eyes in preparation for pain. Instead, there was nothing, Midoriya cracked open one eye and realized that he was floating a few inches off the ground. Next to him, her hand on his arm, was an extremely pretty girl. She was a little shorter than he was, with brown hair that curled around her adorably round face in a bob. Sorry about that. The girl apologized, then brought her fingers together fingers tipped with small, circular pads and then Midoriya landed on his hands and knees after a half second in the air. I didn't want to use my quirk on you without permission, but falling on your face on the first day wouldn't have been fun, right. Midoriya just stared at her. He had no experience with speaking to the opposite gender, not including his mother, and this girl was easily prettier than any of the girls from his middle school. If she noticed his awkward silence, the girl didn't say anything. Instead, she waved at him and jogged towards the school. Good luck on the exam. Maybe we'll be classmates. Once she was gone, Midoriya stood up and grinned proudly. I had just talked to a girl. Ben, who had watched the entire thing, raised an eyebrow. No, you didn't. Now hurry up. The written portion of the exam was certainly hard, but Midoriya had spent as much time honing his mind as he had his body and his skill with his transformations. He was reasonably sure that he'd passed, at least. Ben hadn't said a word until the test was over, and when he had a chance, Midoriya asked why. I'm here to help you, he had said, not to do everything for you. Besides, I've seen your grades, I wasn't worried. With that little boost to his confidence, Midoriya dashed to where the other students had gathered a large auditorium with the lights out, with dozens of seats at tables. As soon as he saw Bakugo, he was thankful that it was dark and chose a seat far away from his former friend. Well, look at this, a live audience. A voice boomed throughout the auditorium as a man wearing what looked like a rocker's outfit with a speaker-like device around his neck stepped onto the stage. He had blonde hair that towered above the rest of him, and he wore sunglasses over a face that couldn't seem to stop smiling. Everybody say hey. Nobody complied. As much as they all wanted to be standout heroes, none of them wanted to stand out here. Still, Midoriya nearly bounced in his seat. That's present Mike. His voice might have come out in a whisper, but he was still excited. I listened to his radio show. 
he's so cool. Had Ben not stopped showing his hologram at that point, he would have rolled his eyes. This was hardly the first, or even the hundredth, time that Midoriya had gushed about a hero. The boy was practically an encyclopedia on heroes and could go on for hours about their quirks, their equipment, their more famous moments, even their favorite foods. Despite the lack of response, present Mike continued on. That's cool, little listeners. I'm here to present the guidelines of your practical exam. Are you ready? Yeah. Still, no one responded, but present Mike kept going. This is how the test will go, listeners. After this presentation, you'll head to assigned locations, but it'll be about the same for each group. As present Mike spoke, each student was given a handout that displayed where they would be going, as well as pictures of four different kinds of robots. You'll be placed in a mock cityscape battle. For ten minutes, you'll have to face different kinds of robots, which we've named faux villains. These guys are worth one, two, or three points each, depending on their model. You all need to destroy as many of these faux villains as possible with your quirks, and get all those sweet points. Oh, and no attacking your fellow examinees. There'll be enough villains on the field as it is. Excuse me, may I ask a question? A tall, muscular student stood up with his hand raised. It was difficult to see much detail in the darkness. But with the spotlight around present Mike reflecting off the lenses, Midoriya could tell that he was wearing glasses. You said that the faux villains are worth between one and three points, but there are four robots displayed here. I expected a school as prestigious as UA to avoid such simple errors. He whirled and pointed at Midoriya, who jumped. And you, you've been muttering nonstop, and it is distracting. Please cease. That's sorry, Midoriya said, trying to become as small as possible. It didn't help that Bakugo turned to look straight at him with the most murderous expression Midoriya had ever seen. Fortunately, before Bakugo could launch into a tirade, present Mike spoke up. All right, examinee listener, that's a good catch, but it's no error. The fourth faux villain just isn't worth any points. It's meant to be the unstoppable obstacle, a monster that'll rampage through the test zone. Each area will have one, and when it shows up, just run, because it's going to ruin your day if you try to fight. The student with glasses bowed sharply, and then sat down. Thank you, sir. My apologies for the interruption. Okay, listeners, that's enough from me. Present Mike raised a fist, his grin never faltering. Go out there and show us how serious you are about being heroes. Plus Ultra. Thankfully for his own safety, Midoriya was not sent to the same location as Bakugo. After changing into a green jogging outfit, he and a portion of the other examinees were taken by bus to an enormous set of double doors. Okay, are all the doors huge here? Ben asked, though it was only his voice coming from the Ultimatrix. I'm starting to feel like someone was compensating for something. Midoriya tried not to laugh and looked for something to distract himself. He found it when he saw a familiar haircut close by. He still hadn't thanked her for before and walked over. He was about to reach out and tap the shoulder of the girl who had helped him but someone else grabbed his shoulder. What do you think you're doing? It was the boy with the glasses again, who was much taller than Midoriya, and giving him an impressive glare. Are you trying to sabotage another examinee? How shameful. What? No. Midoriya shook his head. I was trying to say. The tall boy cut him off by simply whirling around and heading for the door. Midoriya's shoulders slumped as he caught many of the other examinees giving him suspicious looks of their own. Easy, buddy, Ben said. Don't think about anyone else right now. This is about your future, so get your head in the game. Midoriya took a deep breath and nodded. The doors opened, revealing a section of cityscape that could have fit in just about anywhere in Japan. He was about to join the back of the group when present Mike's voice boomed out. And begin. The examinees, Midoriya included, just stood there in confusion. What? You thought you'd get time to prepare. Villains and disasters won't give you a countdown, and neither will you, eh? Get going. The crowd of teenagers immediately charged down the street, shouting and preparing their quirks. Midoriya, however, just slid back his left sleeve, pressed the button on the Ultimatrix, and started cycling through the aliens he had available. Ben hadn't given him access to all of his options, but Midoriya had quickly earned plenty over ten months of work. A urban terrain, lots of sharp corners in the streets, and robots to fight. Midoriya nodded as he made his choice. This should work. He slapped the dial and vanished in a flash of green light. In his place stood a hulking white blob of a creature with black claws, small eyes and a large mouth. On his back, the top of his head and the backs of his arms and legs were yellow plates and on the center of his chest was the Ultimatrix dial. Cannonbolt. He shouted in a deep voice. Yeah, shouting out the name really does feel cool. In the observation room, many of the teachers were intrigued by one examinee's sudden transformation. Interesting, Cementos said. 
He only activated his quirk once he used that device on his wrist. Perhaps he can't use his quirk without an outside factor, Vlad King suggested. Or maybe it's a limiter of some kind, preventing him from accidentally overusing his quirk. Near Vlad King was a small white furred creature that, had it not been wearing a suit, would have been mistaken for a large mouse, a dog, or a very small bear. Whatever he was laughed with glee. I think I know about this one, Principal Nezu said. Keep an eye on him. I have a feeling that he'll provide the most interesting showing of them all. Instead of trying to run on his stubby legs, Cannonbolt took careful aim before he curled up into a ball, his armor covering every part of his white flesh. He then began to roll in place, building up momentum until he finally let go. He shot forward at incredible speed and then ricocheted off the corner of a building. As soon as he turned the corner, he felt himself collide with something that crumpled like tinfoil. Please don't let it be a person, he thought as he uncurled. Thankfully, it was the mangled remains of a faux villain. It had one wheel for legs and spindly arms, and what remained of its chest had a one on it. Right, the one-pointers were fragile, Cannonbolt mused. Darn it, I still haven't gotten the hang of seeing where I'm going when I roll. I should pick a different form, so that I won't hit a person by accident. He slapped the dial on his chest, this time, he turned into XLR8 and dashed down the street. You saw that, right? Flad King waved at the monitor. You all saw that. He changed into a completely different form that has a completely different quirk. The other teachers murmured amongst themselves. Most of the other students were momentarily forgotten as they watched a blue and black velociraptor run at incredible speeds only slowing down when he reached faux villains. He would run up their bodies and deliver a series of kicks at their heads at blinding speeds. Each kick didn't appear to do that much damage, but when hundreds of them were struck in an instant, the faux villains were quickly destroyed. Of all the faculty, only two weren't talking. Nezu just grinned and occasionally giggled to himself, but the other was far from laughing. He was a man so thin that he looked more like a skeleton, and his blonde hair fell around him in a mess, his yellow pinstripe suit was obviously fitted for a man with much more mass. He looked like he had one foot in the grave, but his blue eyes, sunken dangerously into their sockets, gleamed with inner strength. I remember you, he thought to himself. Back on the roof, you said you were quirkless. Now, you have multiple quirks. That isn't possible. Unless no, it's just not possible. Still, Yagi Toshinori couldn't shake the connection his mind had made between this quirkless boy and his greatest enemy. His eyes narrowed as the boy transformed yet again this time into an orange dog-like creature that had no eyes. I need answers. Wild Mutt roared as he tore apart a three-pointer. By his count, he had 34 points. That probably wasn't enough to pass, which meant that he had to step it up. Thankfully, he detected another faux villain, designed like a scorpion, trying to sneak up behind him a two-pointer this time. He rolled out of the way as it tried to smash him, then lunged at its head. His powerful jaws ripped it off in one savage motion. 36 points, he thought. Was that enough? Seven minutes. Present Mike shouted. Better hurry it up, kiddas. Before he could start hunting another robot, the ground shuddered. At first, Wild Mutt thought it was an earthquake, but the way the shaking continued made it seem like something else. Then a nearby building exploded as a massive robot began its rampage. That's the zero pointer. Wild Mutt backed away, growling out of reflex. That thing has to be a hundred feet tall. All around the test zone, examinees abandoned their positions and ran for their lives. As present Mike said, there was no point trying to fight the Zero Pointer, and no one wanted to die today. Wild Mutt was about to join the others when he picked up something moving under some rubble or, rather, someone. It was the girl from before, now trapped up to her waist by heavy chunks of debris. Wild Mutt couldn't see details, but the way she was moving suggested that she was too dizzy to save herself from the massive machine that was about to crush her under its treads. He didn't hesitate. As far as he was concerned, there was someone in trouble, and he had to do something. He ran over to the girl, who looked up at him in confusion and fear, unable to speak, while Mutt just started digging at the rubble. You're not going to get her out before that thing gets here, Ben said as his hologram appeared. His voice was calm, but he looked tense. Either turn into something that can get her out faster, or something that can fight that. While Mutt answered by putting himself between the girl and the zero-pointer, he growled and held his paw over the dial mounted on the armor on his left shoulder. All right. Wild Mutt couldn't see it, but Ben was grinning. Go big or go home, buddy. Wild Mutt vanished in a massive flash of green light. In his place was a true titan, easily as tall as the Zero Pointer. His skin was white, with red highlights running down his arms, legs, and the tall horn on his head. His only clothing consisted of black cargo shorts. His car-sized eyes were narrowed in determination as he raised boulder-sized fists. Way big. 
The titan boomed. In the observation room, the teachers were shocked into silence. The only sound came from Nezu, who was outright cackling in his seat. I'm going down there. There was a puff of steam, and Tashinori Yagi was replaced by a giant of a man nowhere near as large as the titan on the screen, but still imposing. Before All Might could head for the door, a small paw grabbed his sleeve. Now, now, Nezu said calmly, let's not do anything hasty. There's still a test to finish. Are you kidding, sir? All Might gestured to where two giants were about to do battle. The damage they're about to do. We have to trust that all potential students have the spark inside to be heroes, Nezu interrupted. If we rush in and help them every time, that spark will never grow. His eyes gleamed with mischief. Besides, it's not often that someone actually tries fighting the Zero Pointer. Try to relax and enjoy the show. All Might sat back down, but didn't revert to his true form. Who is this boy, Nezu? When I met him last year, he was. I have a few theories, actually. Nezu's eyes took on a calculating gleam as the giant slammed a fist into the robot's head. Once the test is over, if he passes, I plan on having a conversation with him. The way he said that held a hint of menace, but it was reassuring enough for All Might, who finally allowed himself to transform back. Fine, he said after a moment. I'll trust you on this, but you'll let me know if he's connected to he leaned in close to whisper in the principal's ear. Him, Nezu nodded, he still maintained his smile, but his eyes were steely. Of course, All Might. He leaned back in his chair. Now, let's watch the battle, shall we? Of all the aliens Midoriya could turn into, Way Big was the one he had the least experience with. This was because it was impossible to keep it secret at Dagaba Beach. Instead, his mother had driven him out to a campsite on her days off. She had nearly fainted the first time she saw Way Big, and then again when he had accidentally kicked over a tree that almost crushed her car. This time, when he kicked the robot which was actually a bit smaller than he was now he meant to do a lot of damage. The robot's left tread was badly dented, to the point that it moved only sluggishly. When it tried to punch him in the chest, Wei Big deflected it with his left forearm, and then countered with a heavy uppercut to its chin. The robot's head snapped up and back, and Wei Big could hear cables and internal mechanisms snap and tear. Unfortunately, his big hit had also left him open, and since the robot didn't feel pain, it immediately fought back. Way Big winced as the robot's other fist smashed into his side. That was going to leave a bruise. All right, enough of this. Way Big brought both of his hands together and swung in a wide, horizontal arc. They connected with the robot's head with a satisfying crunch of twisted metal, and then the head was sent flying into the distance. Without its head, the robot's body had a hard time doing much of anything, and it slumped over, dead. Oh, man, I hope that didn't hit anyone, Wei Big muttered, though his voice was still loud enough to be heard by anyone within 50 feet. Don't forget the girl, Ben reminded him. He was now perched on Wei Big's shoulder and looked thoroughly impressed. You know, when I said go big or go home, I didn't mean go Wei Big. You could have just zapped it with one of your electric aliens. You've got, like, three right now. Wei Big couldn't respond without giving Ben away, so he ignored him in favor of turning around and kneeling over the girl. Hold on, I'll get you out of there. Surprisingly gentle for such huge hands, Wei Big brushed off the debris that trapped the girl, and then lifted her up in the palm of one hand. Are you okay? He asked. The girl hesitated, then shook her head. I think I twisted my ankle. All right, I'll take you back to the entrance. If you try to do more, you'll just hurt yourself. Is that okay? He waited for her to give him a weak smile and nod, and then he marched over to the aid station that was set up at the entrance. It only took about 10 steps, but halfway there, he felt something on his finger. He looked down and noticed that the girl had thrown up on his hand. As sorry, she called up to him. I was really nauseous after using my quirk for so long. It's fine, Wei Big said, and tried to ignore the fact that the first girl he'd ever spoken to for real this time had just puked on him. Once he reached the aid station, he gently lowered the girl to the ground, where several medical robots equipped with stretchers were waiting. Just as Wei Big was about to leave and maybe get a few more points, Ben materialized in front of his face. Dude, you burned a lot of energy going Wei Big. You should go human again before the dial on Wei Big's chest began to flash red, and Ben sighed. That happens. There was a bright flash of red, and then Midoriya was human again. Unfortunately, he was also suffering the occasional side effect of a forced shutdown after going way big he was about 50 feet in the air, and gravity decided that he needed a reunion with the ground. Ah, uh, Midoriya flailed about as he fell straight down. The Ultimatrix was recharging, so he was helpless until just before he hit the ground, and a hand with pads on the fingertips slapped him across the face. That stung, but it also kept him from turning into a smear on the floor. 
Looks like we're even. The girl joked, and then pressed her fingertips together. Release. Midoriya once again landed safely on the ground, just in time for the girl to throw up again, this time on his shoe. Ugh the girl grabbed a nearby water bottle and washed the vomit out of her mouth. Sorry again. Midoriya tried to shake the vomit off his hand and shoe. It's fine. I wonder if we have enough time to recover and maybe get a few more points. He was interrupted by a loud buzzer and then present Mike's voice. Time's up, kids. You'd better hope that you earned enough points. Or not, Midoriya said glumly and turned to the girl. How many did you get? 28, she replied. What about you? 36. I guess we just have to wait and see if we got in. Yeah. The girl held out her hand. By the way, I'm Yuraka Achako. Thanks for saving me, Deku-kun. Midoriya blinked. Um, that's not my name. It isn't. Yuraka tilted her head. But I heard that other boy call you that. Midoriya shrugged. It's a nickname he gave me when we were kids. It means useless. Yuraka looked shocked. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's just that Deku sounds like you can do it. So I thought it was nice. Midoriya cracked a wobbly smile. That was the first time anyone had ever put a positive spin on that hated nickname. And he found that he liked it. W well, you can call me Deku if you like. Midoriya finally shook her hand, and noted how she was careful not to touch him with all five of her fingers. My real name is Midoriya Izuku. Hey, can I? Excuse me. Both teens turned and saw a little old lady standing behind them. She wore a white doctor's coat and was leaning heavily on a cane. You two can chat, but only while I fix you up. Midoriya's eyes went wide. Oh my gosh, you're the youthful heroine, recovery girl. Yes, yes, I know I'm famous, now sit down. The stern tone in her voice was enough to make Midoriya sit down next to Yuraraka. Fear of the little old lady overrode his nervousness about sitting next to a girl. You, recovery girl pointed at Yuraraka. Tell me where it hurts. Yuraraka shared a bewildered glance with Midoriya. Well, I think I twisted my ankle, and I'm pretty nauseous. Recovery girl nodded. An easy fix. Hold still. She leaned forward and kissed Yuraraka's forehead. In seconds, the girl looked much better, though she seemed to be fighting off drowsiness now. My quirk speeds up the healing process, but you'll be tired for a while. And you, boy, what's the damage? Midoriya gingerly patted his side. I think I just have a few bruises. Good, that means I don't have to do anything. Recovery girl smiled. Tiny injuries like that are best left to heal on their own. Just don't do anything crazy for a day or two. Now, if you'll excuse me, there are other children who need my attention. After recovery girl hobbled away, Midoriya and Yuraraka let out breaths they didn't know they'd been holding. She's kinda scary, Yuraraka said quietly. Yeah. Hey, before she showed up, you were about to say something. Midoriya perked up a bit. Oh, right. Yuraraka-san, I was going to ask how your quirk worked, if that's okay. Yuraraka smiled. Sure. It's called zero gravity. Anything I touch with all five of my fingers becomes weightless. I can cancel it by putting all of my fingertips together. She blushed and scratched the back of her head. I have to sleep with gloves on, or else I make my mattress float. Midoriya had that mental image in his head, laughed, and then put his hand over his mouth. I am sorry. I didn't mean to laugh at you. Yuraraka just waved him off. It's fine, my parents think it's hilarious. She then peered closely at him. What about you? What kind of quirk lets you transform like that? Do you have multiple quirks? Midoriya wished that Ben was there to offer him some reassurance, but the Ultimatrix was still recharging. And when that happened, Ben was offline. Still, this was good practice for explaining his quirk. Uh, it's called unstable genetics. Basically, my DNA is all twisted up, and I can't access my different forms on my own. He held up the Ultimatrix. This, oh I guess you could say it sorts my DNA and lets me access all my forms. I can only use one at a time, and I have to be careful with the time limit. Some forms, like way big, use a lot of energy and eat up how long I can stay transformed. Yuraka nodded, her eyes wide in fascination. Yeah, it makes sense that a quirk that powerful would have a weakness. Still, that was so cool. She suddenly blushed. So, uh, yeah thanks for saving me, Deku-kun. Midoriya then finally realized that he was only a few inches away from her, between his green hair and red face. He did an admirable imitation of a tomato. Why yeah, no problem. The Ultimatrix chose that moment to recharge. The dial went from red to green, and Ben appeared in front of them. He took about two seconds to stare, and then he grinned. Okay, that's adorable. Midoriya couldn't help it. He groaned and put his face in his hands. After saying goodbye to Yuraraka, Midoriya went home to await his results. It would be a week before he found out if he'd passed or failed, and the waiting was torture. His mother and Ben tried to keep his mind off it, but the more they tried to distract him, the more he thought about the exam. He replayed every moment in his head, second-guessing every choice and action he took. 
had he made too many mistakes on the written portion, was 36 points enough to pass the practical, had 10 months of training been for nothing. Finally, after a week of pacing, stress-induced headaches, and restless sleep, Izuku was brought out of his latest worry spell when Inko ran up to him. Izuku, it's here. She thrust an envelope into his face. The letter from Yue just arrived. With shaking hands, Izuku took the envelope from her. H. Hey, mom, can I read this in my room? Inko blinked, and then nodded. Sure, honey, I'll be right outside if you need me. And I'll be with her, to help keep her calm, Ben said, appearing next to her. You go do what you've gotta do, buddy. Izuku shakily nodded and walked into his room. Once the door closed, Inko turned to Ben. Aren't you aware of everything he does, even if your hologram is over here? Ben grinned. Hey, between the two of you, I've got a lot of reassuring to do. Inko huffed, but couldn't keep a smile off her face. Regardless of what happens, I want to thank you. For what? Inko sniffed and fought back tears. Izuku hasn't been this driven since before he found out he was quirkless. You brought back a spark of life in him that I thought I'd never see again. Now, the tears started to fall. If I could hug you, I would. It feels wrong that I can only hug one of my boys. Ben's eyes went wide. He hadn't expected to be considered part of the Midoriya family. He quickly recovered, though he didn't fool Inko. Well, it's all part of my programming. If you really want to thank someone, thank the real Ben. Inko just smiled warmly. I am thanking him. In his room, Midoriya opened the envelope with the care of an archaeologist with a precious find. Instead of a letter, a small disc fell out and landed on his desk. It immediately lit up, projecting the face of a man he thought he'd never see again. I am here as a projection. All Might had his trademark grin plastered across his face. Midoriya Izuku, it's so good to meet you again, even if this is just a recording. When we last spoke, I said some things that undoubtedly hurt you. However, you made quite a splash with your quirk at the entrance exam. Midoriya allowed hope to blossom in his chest. Now, I have good news and bad news. All Might glanced at something off screen and then nodded to himself. The good news is that you passed the written exam with flying colors a 92% score. The bad news, I'm afraid, was that you didn't earn enough villain points during the practical. 36 just isn't enough, even with your impressive written exam. Midoriya's hope died a sudden and tragic death. But, I have a surprise for you, young Midoriya. A hand appeared on the screen, gesturing at All Might. Hurry it up. But I'm trying to build suspense. Fine, okay. Anyway, villain points weren't the only kind of points you could earn during the practical. What kind of heroes would we be if only focused on fighting? We have to put just as much effort into saving others as we do fighting villains. That's why each examinee was given rescue points, based on how well they aided their fellows. In fact, your courage in helping young Uraraka was so impressive that you were awarded 60 rescue points, putting your total at 96. However, your sudden fall at the end did reduce your points a bit. Midoriya was trembling, but didn't dare move. Why couldn't All Might decide whether he wanted Midoriya to feel hope or despair? In the end, you received 86 points in total more than enough to pass the exam. All Might stepped back and held out his arms. Welcome to your first step, this is your hero academia. With that, the projection faded. Midoriya walked in a daze to his door and clumsily opened it. Waiting outside was his mother and Ben. Neither dared to speak first. Finally, a wobbly smile appeared on Izuku's face. I got in. I got in. Sobbing, Inko grabbed her son in the biggest hug she could manage. Mother and son sank to their knees as they cried their hearts out. Izuku's vision was blurry from tears, but he could see Ben sitting next to them with a huge smile of his own. Congratulations, he said. I knew you could do it, hero. Two days later, Midoriya received another message from Yue. This one had less fanfare and was just a simple letter, it requested that he come to the school before the year started, because the principal wanted to discuss something important. There were no other details, something that had been concerned as they took the train to UA. I mean, it's just too vague, he said as they reached their stop. My emotions are artificial, and even I'm worried. Maybe he just wants to talk about my quirk, Midoriya said quietly as he walked up to the entrance to the school. I mean, I can't think of anyone who can do what I did. Point taken, but getting singled out by the principal before school starts is never a good sign. Ben shrugged. Anyway, I'm going to shut off my hologram for a while. Have fun with the guy who decides your future. Ben flickered and vanished, leaving Midoriya to sweat. What if Ben was right and something was up? He didn't worry for long, because he was suddenly distracted by something small that landed on his back when he walked through the gate. Years of being bullied made him freeze and reflex after all. Bullies were less likely to do anything if he didn't react. Come now, son, a soft voice said in his ear, no need to be nervous. Midoriya slowly turned his head and saw a creature that he just couldn't identify. It was certainly cute, 
even with the jagged scar over one eye, but it was still strange. You're probably trying to figure out what I am, aren't you? The creature laughed. Am I a mouse? A dog? A bear? Who knows? W well, I de don't, Midoriya stammered. I de don't even know why your name. Ah, uh, pardon me. The creature jumped and flipped over Midoriya's head and landed in front of him. I am Nezu, principal of UA High. Please, follow me to my office, we have much to discuss. Midoriya nervously followed after Nezu. He was so anxious that he barely had time to look around as he walked, though the few things he did notice just reassured him that UA was definitely the school to go to. I and many of the staff here were very impressed by your actions during the practical exam, Nezu said as they walked. I can honestly say that we have never seen a quirk quite like yours, it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, th thank you. Nezu laughed as he opened the door to his office, where a pot of tea was sitting on his desk. Can I offer you some green tea? Oh, why yes, please. Nezu hopped onto his tall chair and passed Midoriya a cup before taking his own. The two each took a sip of tea before Nezu spoke again. As I said, your quirk is fascinating. He leaned forward, and his eyes gleamed. In fact, after some reflection, I find it hard to believe that it's a quirk at all. Midoriya nearly spat out his tea. Despite the heat of the drink, he broke out in cold sweat. I then took a look at your quirk registry, Nezu continued, as if he didn't notice Midoriya's reaction. According to that, you were registered as quirkless until almost a year ago, until you were checked again by a Dr. Tennyson Somion whose own record is paper thin, I might add. Unstable genetics is an interesting quirkunable to be used, except with that support item on your wrist and grants you transformations with multiple abilities. One would be hard-pressed to really call that a quirk, wouldn't you agree? And Nezu-san, I see can explain, I. With all due respect, Midoriya-san, I'm not talking to you right now. Nezu took another sip of tea. I've reviewed the security footage of you before, during, and after the tests. You like to murmur a lot, and your eyes kept glancing to empty spaces nearby. Who are you talking to, I wonder? Huh? Ben appeared next to Midoriya. I can't say I was expecting someone to be that observant, or to do research on Ben Tennyson. I thought we'd done enough. When creating Midoriya's new quirk registry, he had turned into the super smart gray matter to fabricate Ben Tennyson's existence on this earth. According to everything he knew about the government's records on quirks and he knew a lot he had created enough to pass casual inspection. Nezu, it seemed, had done far more than a casual inspection. Cat's out of the bag, buddy, Ben said calmly. If he wanted to hurt you, he would have done it already, and certainly before you were accepted into the school. I think, I think he just wants answers. You're right, Midoriya said, though Nezu was only hearing half of the conversation. I think not telling him will only cause problems. He took a deep breath. Okay, show him. Ben flickered, and then Nezu leaned back in his chair when the hologram was suddenly visible. Hello, there. Nezu's ears twitched, and then he smiled widely. Hello, I believe you have some things to tell me. For almost an hour, Midoriya and Ben explained everything the Ultimatrix, the real Ben Tennyson, the steps they had taken to help Midoriya become a hero, and everything else. By the time they were done, Midoriya had his head bowed. Please, sir, he said quietly, I know that I lied about having a quirk, and about where my powers come from, and if you want to punish me for it, that's fine. All I ask is that you don't blame my mom for this. Nezu was silent for a long time. He barely even blinked. Finally, he nodded. All right, I think I've heard enough. Midoriya shot Ben a nervous look as the principal stood in his chair. Everything you did was in the service of helping others as a hero, not for your own personal gain. Because of that, I won't turn you into the police or share anything that you've told me today. However, there's a chance that someone else will put two and two together, and since I see you becoming quite the hero, I'll take it upon myself to cover your tracks. Midoriya did a double take. What? Don't get me wrong. The way you falsified your background was good enough for government work, but some pro heroes might be a little suspicious and dig deeper. For your sake, I'll add in my own contribution. By the time I'm done, everything will seem to be on the up and up. Nezu winked. This wouldn't be the first time I've changed records to fool humans, it's something of a hobby of mine, actually. Midoriya let out a shaky breath, and then got out of his chair to bow low. Thank you so much, Nezu-san. Ah, but while I do believe that you'll be a great hero in the future, I'm not doing this for free, Nezu said, and put his paws behind his back. I would like something in return. Midoriya glanced at Ben, who shrugged. What is it? How many aliens did you say you can turn into at the moment? Uh, 50. And you've had only 10 months to discover 50 different transformations, whereas other people spend their whole lives mastering just one quirk. You have a great deal of catching up to do, as such, I want you to come to school for 3 hours every Saturday for additional practice, overseen by me. 
you will spend each day focusing on just one alien. Between Ben and myself, I'm sure we can help you achieve mastery with each of your forms. Ben raised an eyebrow. And why do you want to do that? Nezu grinned. Because then I can claim that I've spent more time with aliens than anyone else on this planet. At the looks he was getting, he shrugged. That. And I'd hate to see such a promising student come through these halls with only passable skills. Consider this an investment in your future as a hero. Just keep in mind that, with these extra lessons, I expect you to be in the top five of your class at all times. And I would hope that you shoot for the number one spot. I will, Nezu-san. I mean, Nezu-sensei, Midoriya said, his eyes full of resolve. I want to show everyone who thought I was useless that they were wrong about me. And I think the best way to do that would be the next top pro hero. An excellent attitude, Midoriya-san. Nezu clapped his paws together. I'm glad that we could reach an agreement. Now, please return home and get ready for class. Yue has a reputation for being the best, and that means we expect the best from our students. Midoriya shot to his feet and bowed, Ben just nodded, and then vanished. After excusing the boy, Nezu waited until the door closed, and then picked up his phone. He only waited for two rings before All Might picked up. Did you speak to him? I wouldn't be calling if I hadn't, Nezu said. You'll be happy to know that your fears are completely unfounded. Then how does he have multiple quirks? That isn't my place to say. Nezu's tone was polite, but firm. Just know that his abilities are completely unconnected to his. I understand. I'll do my best to remember that. See that you do, since you'll be teaching his class. Wait, I thought I was teaching the third year classes. Nezu chuckled. Toshinori, you've never taught anyone before, and you want to teach the advanced classes. You'll have to pick a different time to train your new protege, perhaps on Saturdays. Why do I get the feeling that you're planning something? Please, I'm always planning something. Just rest assured that I have your best interests at heart. Gran Torino said the same thing, and I still remember the bruises. That's your problem, not mine. See you tomorrow to finish all that paperwork you owe me. Before All Might could respond, Nezu hung up. Rather than immediately get to back to the work that was already piling up, Nezu leaned back in his chair and thought about all he had learned. He hadn't lied when he said he wanted Midoriya to reach his full potential, but he couldn't help but be excited. He was positive that that boy, so plain looking, but with such extraordinary powers and drive, would become the biggest sensation since All Might's debut. Who wouldn't be excited about that? Well this is it, Izuku said. It is, Inko agreed, looking up at her son proudly. I'm glad we're all on the same page, Ben said. But if you don't actually walk through the door, you're going to miss the train. And then you'll be late for your first day of school. Izuku drooped. Way to ruin the moment. When his mother giggled, he gave her a betrayed look. Mom, sorry, honey, but it's true. She took a moment to try and fix the mess that was his red tie, but gave up. Just do your best, okay? Izuku gave her a quick hug. I will, mom. He looked over at Ben. Are you ready? Ben laughed. Dude, I was literally made ready. Midoriya felt as self-conscious as he usually did when he entered the campus. Sure, it was now the third time he'd been at UA, but it was the first time while wearing the school uniform a grey coat with green highlights over a white shirt, green pants, and a red tie. At least Midoriya was able to keep his red shoes. For most of his life, he had been obsessed with having red shoes. Something Ben had teased him about. So, I'm in class 1A, Midoriya muttered to himself, navigating through the hallways until he found the heroics course. I really hope Kakan isn't in the class with me. From what I've seen, the universe hasn't been that kind to you, Ben, now speaking from the Ultimatrix, reminded him dryly. Why would it start now? Well, it sent you here, and you chose me, right? Ben materialized in front of him, albeit upside down, and gave him a look. Oh, so now you decide to be a little snarky. It only took 10 months. He glanced over Midoriya's shoulder and then disappeared again. Heads up, the Uraraka girl is coming your way. Try not to stutter, okay? Deku-kun. Hi. Midoriya turned. There, walking towards him, was indeed Uraraka. She wore a uniform similar to his, but with a green skirt and black stockings. To his chagrin, her tie was immaculate. H. Hi, Uraraka-san, he said. Oh, come on. Ben shouted in Midoriya's ear. What did I just say about stuttering? I guess you got into UA after all. Uraraka beamed at him. I was worried I wouldn't make it in, but then I found out about rescue points, and I got enough to pass. Why yeah, so did I, Midoriya said. He didn't mention that, with 86 points in total, he'd nabbed the top score. He felt that bragging was uncool. Hey, what class are you going to? Uraraka asked as they started to walk again. 1A. Uraraka gasped. No way. So am I. We get to be in the same class, that's so awesome. Midoriya gave her one of his wobbly smiles. He was more grateful to have someone he knew and was on good terms with in the same class, other than Ben, than she could ever know. 
I heard we're getting a short day today, Uraraka went on. They'll probably just do an entrance ceremony, and some orientation or something. Yeah, that makes sense, Midoriya said. I mean, even if all the heroics courses are nearby, this is still a big campus. Uraraka suddenly grabbed his arm with only four fingers, so that he wouldn't float away and point it up. Oh, Deku-kun, look, there's our class. The sign for the class was so innocuous, but the door itself was huge, and Midoriya was almost overwhelmed. With trembling hands, he slid the door open, and almost closed it immediately when a familiar voice filled his ears. What? You think you're hot shit, you worthless extra. I told you the universe wasn't that nice to you, Ben said, though he sounded annoyed at being right. True enough, Bakugo Katsuki was in the class, his feet propped up on his desk. He looked all the parts of a school thug he had ditched his tie. His clothes were rumpled, and his expression suggested he was just begging for someone to give him a reason to blow them up. How crass, is that really the attitude a hero student should be adopting? And there was the other student Midoriya was hoping he wouldn't run into. It was the tall boy with the glasses, and he was doing his utmost to lecture Bakugo, who couldn't care less. The boy was waving his arm in a rapid, if stiff, motion as he tried to get Bakugo to take him seriously, but as soon as the door opened, he whirled, and his eyes settled on Midoriya. Phew. Out of reflex, Midoriya flinched, especially when the tall boy marched up to him. He was then surprised when the boy bowed. You're the one who made the top score on the entrance exam. I am Ida Tenya, and I must apologize for my behavior towards you. Obviously, someone who is able to glean the true point of the test must embody what it means to be a hero. I think he's talking about the rescue points, Ben said, sounding more amused than anything. Also, if you wanted to keep your top score a secret, that cat is now officially out of the bag. Sure enough, the entire class was staring at him some with wonder, others with envy, and Bakugo with disbelieving fury. Even Uraraka gave him a look of astonishment as the class erupted with comments. Wait, that's the guy who got the top spot. So manly. He's kinda plain, though, isn't he? Hey, that just means he's got an awesome quirk. Deku, Bakugo growled as he got out of his seat. The sheer malice that came from that single word was enough to get the rest of the class attention. What the hell are you doing here, you fraud? For a moment, Midoriya thought that Bakugo somehow knew about the Ultimatrix, but then Ben's voice filled his ears. Easy, he thinks you're still quirkless, I mean, you are, but whatever. Anyway, don't do anything to set him off, and you'll be fine. I've already set him off by being here. Midoriya wanted to shout. Instead, he just backed up. Until his heel connected with something soft, his stumble was enough to get even Bakugo's attention, and they all looked down. Even Ben was stumped by what he was seeing. Is that a yellow caterpillar? Before Midoriya could ask his own question, that squishy yellow caterpillar rolled over to reveal the most tired human face he'd ever seen, sucking on a juice box. The sheer randomness of what they were seeing made almost the entire class freak out. Some students screamed about the caterpillar, others babbled, and everyone else just stared. So noisy, the caterpillar man said, and unzipped the sleeping bag he'd been lying in. This is a class for heroes, and you're all being so irrational. Caterpillars don't talk or drink juice boxes, after all. I think everyone is just weirded out that he's in a sleeping bag in a class, Ben commented. Who is this hobo, anyway? That was something Midoriya was trying to figure out, minus the hobo comment. The haggard man had long, unkempt hair and looked like he hadn't shaved in at least two days. He wore black, practical clothes, and what looked like an incredibly long gray scarf around his neck and shoulders. Midoriya was positive that he knew who the man was, but he just couldn't put his finger on it. Anyway, the former caterpillar said, I'm Aizawa Shota, your homeroom teacher. Nice to meet you, I suppose. Now, I want all of you to head to the locker rooms, get changed, and meet me at the grounds, we have work to do. Where the regular school uniforms were somewhat subdued, the gym uniforms were loud and bright. They were blue, with red and white highlights, the white parts spelled out UA across their bodies. While changing, Midoriya did everything possible to keep Bakugo away from him, mostly. That involved putting Ada between him and Bakugo. For his part, Ada didn't seem to notice, even when Bakugo continued to send glares at Midoriya when the taller boy's back was turned. Eventually, the students made their way out to what looked like a fairly regular PE field. The only difference was that the field at the center of the track had several different machines in place. Waiting for them with a scowl was Aizawa. It took you all 10 minutes to get here, even with those basic gym uniforms. A pro hero can get into the most complicated costume and respond to a crisis in five. Not a good start. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the field. Come on, we'll be testing your quirks and physical abilities today. Um, excuse me, Aizawa-sensei. Hiroraka held up her hand. 
What about the entrance ceremony? Aizawa looked like he would have scoffed, if not for the effort required. Here at UA, we have a more freestyle approach to education. That means that I can drag you all away from that kind of thing if I so choose. He glanced back at the equipment. You all remember the physical fitness tests you did back in middle school, right? They didn't allow the use of quirks in those, but that's irrational. Quirks are just as much a part of the body as any muscle. He pointed at Bakugo. Hugh, what was your record for the softball throw in middle school? Bakugo raised an eyebrow. 67 meters. Why? Aizawa pulled what looked like a baseball out of his pocket and tossed it to him. Go stand in the circle over there. Use your quirk to send the ball as far as you can. As long as you don't leave the circle, I don't care what you do. Now, Bakugo grinned. Awesome. He stomped over to the circle that surrounded a solid mound of dirt, and then sneered at Midoriya. This is how the real thing does it, Deku. He drew his arm back, and then hurled the ball skyward. Just before it left his hand, he unleashed a massive explosion. Die. Everyone watched as the ball rocketed out of sight. Most of them began murmuring amongst themselves, but Midoriya started to sweat. Was he telling the ball to die, or me? Aizawa pulled out what looked like a phone from his other pocket and looked at the screen. 705 meters. He looked back at the class. It's important for us to establish a baseline of what you can do with your quirks. That way, we know what to improve. It'll be hard for you, Ben said, materializing again and wearing the UA gym uniform. For some reason and leaning on Midoriya's shoulder. I mean, you could do well on almost all of these tests with just a couple of aliens, and you've got a lot more in the wings. The rest of the class was also excited. Man, did you see that explosion? That was so awesome. We get to use our quirks however we want here. This is going to be so much fun. The comments continued like that for a while, until Aizawa gave them a terrifying glare. Midoriya wasn't sure what the man's quirk was, but it had something to do with the way his eyes glowed red and his hair rose up. Fun? You think this is all about fun? The man seemed to ooze killing intent, to the point that most of the class was immediately terrified. A few students were able to meet his gaze Midoriya, and Bakugo had already been exposed to near death thanks to their run-in with that sludge villain ten months ago. There was also another boy who didn't back down. He had a horrible burn over his left eye, and his hair was divided into two colors pure white on his right, and red on his left. Here at UA, you've got three years to become the best heroes you can be, Aizawa continued. You don't have time for fun and games. Right now, I am the one who holds your fate in my hands, as far as you're concerned, I'm judge, jury, and executioner. If you really think I'm kidding, listen up. Whoever does worst on these tests will be expelled, no questions asked. What? A pink-skinned girl with hair as messy as Midoriya's, albeit with short horns popping out, gaped at him. That's totally unfair. Now Aizawa grinned, it was a little creepy, and promised and told pain. Unfair, you say. The world is full of unfair things. It's better that you learn that now, while you still have opportunities in life. If you want really want to be heroes, you have pushed through your comfort zones. That's what it means to go beyond, to be plus ultra. His grin turned even more menacing. Now, show me what you can do. Unbeknownst to 1A, several pairs of eyes were watching what was about to unfold. Hey, hey, is Aizawa sensei really going to expel one of them? A beautiful girl with long blue hair grinned excitedly. That's kind of mean, don't you think? A boy with black hair and an expression of abject misery pressed his forehead against the pillar they were hiding behind. Better them than me, I know I'd fail if I was in their place. Oh, come on, they'll do fine. A tall, muscular boy with blonde hair said, and clapped the other boy on the shoulder. We have to have some faith in those freshmen, right, all might. The new teacher quickly wiped away the trickle of blood coming down his chin, and then gave the shorter blonde his signature smile. Of course, young Mirio. Somehow, All Might managed to make his voice sound like a boom and a whisper at the same time. Still, I'm just here to get a feel for my new students. Why are you three here? The blonde, Tagata Mirio, grinned right back. Well, I heard that the kid who got the top score at the entrance exam had an awesome quirk, and I had to check it out. The other boy, Amajiki Tamaki, drooped. Mirio dragged me here. The girl, Hado Nejire, practically bounced in place, and I snuck out to join them. All Might shook his head when he had chosen Tagata as his successor. He should have known that the other two members of the Big Three would be right behind him. They were practically a package deal. At least Tagata had decided to keep the secret of one for all, at least until he could convince All Might that his friends could be trusted. Hey, hey, I think that boy you wanted to see is up. Hado pointed at the green-haired boy as he walked up to the starting line of the 50-yard dash. What's he doing with that watch? Who, is it some kind of support item? Neat. All Might put a hand on the girl's shoulder. 
Just watch and find out. Midoriya wasn't sure what terrified him more at that point but Hugo's glare, Aizawa's threat, or Ida's earnestness as the two of them got ready for the 50-yard dash. The taller boy had bowed and then shook his hand before getting ready. As he activated the Ultimatrix and began cycling through his aliens, Midoriya noticed that Ida was rolling up his pants to expose his calves. Aside from being incredibly thick, Ida's legs also had what looked like exhaust pipes poking out from his skin. If I had money, I'd bet he has super speed, Ben said, almost eagerly as he disappeared again. Give him a run for his money. Everyone closed their eyes when Midoriya vanished in a flash of green light. XLR8 More than one student went slack-jawed at Midoriya's transformation, though Aizawa only raised an eyebrow. He had seen this one during the entrance exam or, rather, a recording of the entrance exam, which present Mike had shoved into his face and wouldn't leave him alone until he watched it. Aizawa had barely started his stopwatch when XLR8 disappeared in a blur, only to reappear at the finish line. Aizawa was almost impressed, but waited until Ida finished with a flashy burst of speed from the engines in his legs before giving the results. Ida 4.3 seconds, Midoriya 0.08 seconds. Everyone was completely flabbergasted. Even Bakugo was reduced to confused anger. Almost every other test was completed using four arms and Midoriya was glad that he had asked Ben to change his outfit in that form, because the first one was so embarrassing. Instead of briefs and a harness, four arms now had dark blue jeans, a white shirt, a black open vest over that, and black fingerless gloves on all four of his hands. He even had a black do-rag to complete the ensemble. Push-ups, side-stepping, long jumps all of it was easy with four arms physique. During the grip strength test, the only student who had come close to four arms strength had been one Shoji Mizo, a massive gray-haired boy who wore a mask over most of his face and had six webbed arms who finished with an incredible 540 kilograms. Still, four arms had more than doubled that. Even the seated toe touch was a breeze, since his arms were long enough to reach his feet. The only other time he used a different alien was during the endurance run. He had gone back to XLR8 and ran laps around the other students until Aizawa told him to stop. It's obvious that you can go on for a while, Aizawa had said. Stop wasting my time and head to the softball throw. Midoriya turned back to human again ostensibly to stretch for a moment, but really it was to let the Ultimatrix recharge before heading for the circle. As he did so, the other students collapsed on the grass to watch. I wonder what he'll turn into this time, said Jairo Kayoka, a petite girl with short hair who had what looked like headphone jacks coming from her earlobes. That one he called four arms was pretty strong. I hope he's got more than just those two quirks. Hiroshima Ijiro, a muscular boy with spiky red hair and triangular teeth, grinned excitedly. He does. Iroraka smiled right back. Kirishima had an infectious enthusiasm that made him hard to dislike. When I saw him at the entrance exam, he turned into this orange dog thing, and then a giant that he used to destroy the Zero Pointer. Hiroshima did a double take between her and Midoriya. Seriously, the entire time, Bakugo was seething. How did that worthless, pathetic Deku, who couldn't even get his parents' worthless quirks, become strong? It had to do with that watch, obviously. Bakugo was observant, and he'd seen Deku twist that dial on the watch and then slam it down before transforming. What he couldn't figure out was how that factored into his quirk. I'm getting some goddamn answers when this is over, he swore. Then Midoriya vanished in a flash of green again. When it faded, the class was reminded that the plain-looking boy was full of surprises. Armadrillo. This new form looked like a ten-foot-tall yellow robot. The parts that weren't bright yellow were black, except for the silver claws, tail, and what looked like springs running through his arms. Those arms were huge and went all the way to the ground, giving him a hunched appearance. Like all of his forms, this one had a green hourglass dial on his chest. Okay, I give up. Kaminari Denki, a boy with blonde hair with a black lightning bolt running through it, threw up his hands. Does he just have, like, unlimited quirks or something? Rather than answer, Armadrillo stomped over to the circle and picked up the ball with one hand. He then lifted that arm up at a high angle, the piston coming out from his elbow pulled back, and then rapidly pushed forward. There was a loud bang, and then the ball rocketed out of his hand, followed by a tremor that staggered those of the class that hadn't been sitting. Once the shaking stopped, Aizawa glanced down at the sensor and raised an eyebrow. Not bad. Armadrillo walked over to him. How did I do? Aizawa turned the screen to face Midoriya as he turned back to normal. On it flashed the number 811. 
more than one of Midoriya's classmates made impressed noises. Deku, Midoriya flinched as Bakugo stormed up to him, one hand crackling and sparking, while the other grabbed Midoriya by the collar. At that point, Bakugo had had enough. Not only had the worthless Deku shown up the entire class in every other test, he'd gone and beaten his record. In Bakugo's mind, that was an unacceptable transgression that needed immediate correcting and that started by getting answers. You're gonna tell me how you have a quirk, and you're gonna tell me right goddamn now. Hey, hey, that's not cool. Hado frowned. We should stop him. Tagata looked like he was about to do just that. Though Amajiki looked like he'd rather be anywhere else. Before anyone could do anything, All Might stepped in front of them. Just relax, he assured them. Aizawa has this covered. Just as Bakugo was about to bring his sparking hand down, the glow in his palm abruptly vanished. Both he and Midoriya stared blankly at his hand. What the hell? Bakugo reacted as he normally did when he didn't understand something he got angry. What happened to my quirk? I erased it. Bands of cloth suddenly looped around Bakugo's head and shoulders and dragged him back. Behind him, looking bored, Aizawa's eyes glowed and his hair stood up. This isn't how I want to spend my morning. I already have dry eye, I don't need this. Finally, Midoriya realized why Aizawa was so familiar to him. I know you, you're a racer head. Aizawa looked surprised, but everyone else in the class was just confused. You're an underground hero that doesn't usually interact with the press, so most people don't know about you. Your quirk is erasure, and it lets you stop anyone you look at from using their quirks, unless they're mutant types. For a moment, Aizawa looked downright shocked, even as he secured Bakugo. There's a reason I'm an underground hero. How do you know so much about me? Midoriya suddenly found the ground very interesting. Uh, heroes and quirks are a hobby of mine, Eraserhead Sensei. Just call me Aizawa Sensei, the hero said. Hero names are for fieldwork. Now then, Bakugo, he freed the student from his capture tool and gave him a stern look, even as his quirk faded. Consider this your only warning if you attack another student, I won't hesitate to expel you. Is that understood? Bakugo was stuck staring at Aizawa in shock. In all his years at schools before now, teachers had just let him do whatever he wanted, especially when it came to Deku. After all, his grades were perfect, and he was destined to be a pro hero, so no one wanted to stop him. Apparently, the teachers at UA had more of a backbone. He found himself grudgingly respecting the sleepy man. Understood, Aizawa Sensei. Without another glance at Midoriya, Bakugo stomped off and sat as far away from the class as he could while still considered to be participating. Anyway, now that those two are done, everyone else can finish the ball throw. Aizawa sighed tiredly. Everyone hurry up so that I can get some sleep. With the excitement over, the rest of the test was mostly uneventful. Some of the students threw the ball further than others, but it was only when it was Yuraraka's turn that it got interesting. Rather than throw it, she gave Midoriya a nervous smile pressed her fingers against the ball, and gently tossed it up. It never came back down. Aizawa tried to get a read on how far it went, but his sensor just flickered and spouted a series of numbers and letters. He frowned and slapped the machine a few times, the screen fizzled, and then settled on an infinity symbol. Holy expletive, Ben said as he sat next to Midoriya, who gave him a quick glance when nobody was looking. What? Ben programmed me not to swear. For his part, Midoriya was just glad that someone else was getting all the attention, though he did feel bad for Yuraraka, because she looked incredibly embarrassed. All right, enough of that, Aizawa said as he applied eye drops to his eyes. Your total scores simply reflect your performance. Oh, and I was lying about expelling anyone. He grinned almost maniacally. It was a logical ruse to get you all to perform at your best. Almost the entire class stared at him, dumbfounded. What? Tagata struggled not to laugh. Oh, that's hilarious. Amajiki slumped over even further. No, that's cruel. Hado giggled and turned to All Might. Did you know he was going to do that? All Might kept up his famous smile, but inside, he was as floored as the one of students. No, I can't say I did. Oh, please, it was obvious. The girl who had spoken Yeyarazu Momo, a beautiful, tall girl with her long hair pulled back in a spiky ponytail looked disappointed with her class. They wouldn't expel one of us that easily. Aizawa raised an eyebrow, as if he was tempted to expel someone just to prove her wrong, but then pressed a button on his device, and a holographic screen came up. Anyway, here are your scores. Once again, Midoriya received plenty of glances when the scores came up. After all, he'd come in first place. Bakugo had come in second, followed by Yeirazu, and the boy with the two-toned hair, Todoroki Shoto. Ida was just behind him at fifth place, and all the way at tenth was Yuraraka. When Midoriya looked at her, she seemed happy enough, probably because she wasn't in last. That dubious honor fell to one Minta Minoru, a very small boy that had purple spheres instead of hair. 
He had also been the target of dirty looks from everyone else in the class for the way he'd been drooling literally over the girls in 1A. At least his brush with expulsion had made him stop for a while. And that's all I had planned for today, Aizawa said. Get changed and head back to class. You'll find more information about the curriculum on your desks. Take it and head home. See you tomorrow, I guess. Even Yeyorazu had nothing to complain about. Few teenagers ever passed up on a half day. Unfortunately for Midoriya, as they were heading back to the lockers, he became the class focus. So, Midori, what's up with your quirk? The pink girl grinned at him. The name's Ashido Mina, by the way. Yeah, I was gonna ask that. An arm was slung around Midoriya's shoulders. The arm and its opposite had large, canister-shaped elbows. But other than that, the owner of the limb was fairly normal. He had black hair and an easygoing smile. Oh, and I'm Siro Hanta. Midoriya took a deep breath. He just had to remind himself that this was practice for explaining the ultimatrix. W well, you see, I actually thought I was quirkless until a little under a year ago. I can't actually use my quirk, unstable genetics, without this. He held up the watch, but then quickly put his arm back down. If I didn't use that to separate the different DNA, I'd never be able to transform and if I could, I'd probably explode from all those different transformations happening at once. Yeyorazu frowned. If you thought you were quirkless, how did you get that device? Midoriya was grateful that she had brought that up. Actually, Nezu had contacted him with some additions that he'd added to Midoriya's cover story to make it more believable. The hard part was addressing Yeyorazu he already had a problem talking to girls, and she was by far the prettiest he'd ever seen. Th the thing is, I have a sea cousin in America W we're not related by B blood, he married into the family. He's a S scientist, and he de-developed new ways of testing for quirks. When he figured out what my quirk was, he designed my watch to help me become a hero. He's a huge fan of heroes and quirks, just like me. That was really cool of him, Ciro said. What's his name? Ben Tennyson, Midoriya answered. He kind of forced me to always call him by his first name. He's kind of a recluse, though, I haven't even spoken to him in person. That part was technically true. He had never met the real Ben Tennyson, and had only interacted with a hologram of him. With his attention diverted by the rest of class as they asked him questions, Midoriya never noticed Bakugo stalking behind the group, hands shoved into his pockets. He listened to everything Midoriya said and filed it away. Something about what he was saying felt off, but he couldn't put his finger on why. He'd figure it out, though, there was no way that Deku could become strong by himself. The alternative was that the nerd was better than him, and that just wasn't possible. Aizawa, you liar. All Might crossed his arms, but maintained his smile as he walked up to the other teacher. All Might. Aizawa raised an eyebrow at the big three until they ran off, and then turned his attention back to the taller man. What did I lie about? You know exactly what. All Might pointed at him. That logical deception, as you called it, was a load of hooey. Last year, you expelled an entire class of first years. Aizawa shrugged. That class was a lost cause, this one has potential. Anyway, why are you spying on what I'm doing? Shouldn't you be getting ready for your class tomorrow? Don't worry, everything's been planned out. All Might let out his signature booming laugh. I just wanted to get a feel for the students before I actually met them. That's actually a rational decision, and I hate you for it. Now that you mention it, I did have a question for you, All Might said, and his tone became thoughtful. What did you think of young Midoriya? Hmm, Aizawa shrugged again. His quirk has more potential than any I've ever heard of, but if he doesn't have the mindset of a hero, I don't care if he's more powerful than you, if he can't hack it, I'll kick him out so fast his head will spin. All Might felt a drop of sweat roll down his neck. Well, young Midoriya, it seems that all of your teachers have high expectations of you. That just means that I can't afford to cut you any slack tomorrow. Show me that there's more to you than a flashy quirk. There you go, Deku-kun. Hiroaka smiled as she handed Midoriya back his phone. Thanks for giving me your number. You too, Ada-san. Of course, Midoriya leaned back to avoid Ada's rigid flailing of his arm. Pro heroes usually maintain contact with each other, especially if they operate in the same location. Midoriya nodded enthusiastically, while he wasn't as by the book as his taller classmate. He and Ida had discovered that they were equally enthusiastic about hero protocols and patterns. That had led to them discussing team-ups, and during the energetic conversation, Midoriya had pulled Yuraka in, using her as an example of how she, Midoriya and Ida could complement each other. That had then led to Yuraka suggesting that they exchange phone numbers. Midoriya had become flustered, but eventually managed to clumsily fish his phone out of his pocket. Ida had paused, pushed his glasses further up on his nose, and then took out his own phone. All right, Yuraka pumped her fist. Friends should always exchange numbers. Midoriya's eyes stung, and he tried to stop the tears before they started. 
Why you really w want to be f friends with me, Yuraraka san. Yuraraka grinned. Sure, you're sweet and you're cool, even if you're a little awkward, so why not? Midoriya managed a wobbly smile back, while Ida bowed. I am honored that you would consider me a friend as well, Yuraraka san, he said formally. We have known each other for less than a day, but I am sure that we will all get along swimmingly. Yuraraka giggled, but then she looked at the time. Oh, man, I need to get going or I'll miss my train. Bye, Ida-san, bye, Deku-kun. See you tomorrow. The two boys waved goodbye, and then Ida nodded at Midoriya. I am afraid that I must say goodbye as well, Midoriya-san. My own train is at a different station. Sure thing. See you tomorrow. Once Ida was gone, and Midoriya was sure he was alone, he turned to Ben, whose hologram had shifted back to normal. I have friends. I have friends on my first day of school, at UA. Ben smiled. Yeah, and one of them is really cute. Good for you. Midoriya was too excited to be flustered at that moment. She said I was sweet. She said I was cool. She also said you were awkward, Ben pointed out. You might want to work on that. His ego checked, Midoriya sagged. Yeah I know. Come on, buddy, let's go home. Ben vanished once again. Besides, the sooner you go to sleep, the sooner you can come back, and one of your classes is being taught by All Might. Get a little excited. Midoriya smiled. Yeah, you're right. Tomorrow is going to be a good day. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 2. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.